We were looking last time at several uh, statements concerning the two questions, the nature and the extent of creation, and we'll be on this evening, questions concerning the need and the purpose of creation, and then... ...dramatic questions that are frequently raised over the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis which throughout our studies in this class at least will be our primary text, although we'll be running other references. The first 11 chapters of Genesis will constitute our primary textual basis for what we'll be studying and what we'll be saying. Now, I suppose that it's no new thing. I suppose it's happened for hundreds and even thousands of years. Men raising the question, why? Has God, those that believe in God and believe that he has created all things, why has God created all things? And it's a question that we want to look at. We'll be looking under this the, the question of the need of creation. Did God do it for any particular need in himself? And if not, then what is the purpose of creation? It's no small question to raise and to answer when, at least on our time scale, if you want to think of God existing from everlasting to everlasting as we read in scriptures like Psalm 90, verses 1 and 2, and Micah 5, 2, that he has been from old and will be for everlasting. Let's just take a figure out of a hat, a trillion years, and let's say there were a trillion years from our point of mind, from our point of reference, a trillion years before Genesis 1, before God created anything. There are a trillion years there. And after Revelation 22, there's going to be another trillion years. So you see how small, of course, it's greater than that. See, I'm just picking a number out of a hat, a trillion years. It's a lot greater than that. However long it was, it was greater. But then here we are, earth and man created, I mean, just a speck within this long uh, time scale of a trillion years this way, a trillion years that way, and we're right here in the middle. Now, and this is why philosophers and men have raised the question, if God's existed for a trillion years, then why all of a sudden decide to create something? Because he's been self-sufficient, he's been self-sustaining, He's been in, we could say, self-isolation, the Godhead, because there was no one else around. And he's been that way for a trillion years. Now, we know he's not going to be that way for the next trillion years because of his creation that he's done. You see, everything that happened before Genesis 1 and everything that happened after Genesis 1 are two different things, starting with Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created. We have a whole new beginning epic there because nothing will ever be the same again. As far as God's concerned, nothing will ever be the same again. Because you see, for that previous trillions of trillions of years, there was only the Godhead. And now for the remaining trillions of trillions of years, that's not going to be true. Because God has his creation both saved and lost as far as individuals go that will exist forever, God knowing both of them and where both of them will be. So beginning with Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We have what we might call a watershed, water running down both sides because we've had, we have an epic-making event with respect to God so that he will never, now not that God has changed, but his purpose and plan and what is around him will never, never be the same again. So it's no small question, and we can see why others have raised the question, then why has God created all things? And he waited a trillion, trillion years before he did it. And then he did it, and it's going to only last so long on this earth, and then it's going to stop, and then we enter in from our point of reference to the everlasting. Well, what about the question of the need of creation? You think about this on your own now as you're, as you're writing and listening. Did God need to create anything? Now, you think about all the praise, all the glory that he receives now. Not only from Christians, but from creation itself. All the praise and the glory. What's everyone smiling for? And the honor. 
that he's receiving from what he has created, did he need to create anything? Well, let's turn over to Acts chapter 17. Well, this is what we'd like to think, that he needed us. But I guess you know that's just not true. No, God had no intrinsic need of creating, creating anything, totally self-sufficient, totally self-sustaining in himself. And this is one of many areas where he's different from all of his creation. Now, he maintains a vital relationship between himself and creation by means of providence and by means of preservation, but at the same time, he's totally transcendent from all things that he has created. Now, God is the one who's totally self-sufficient, totally self-sustaining, but as I said, there's nothing else anywhere that has ever or that will ever exist that can fit under that category of being self-sustaining and self-sufficient. Acts chapter 17 and verse 23. For as I passed by Paul preaching to the, to the superstitious Athenians, behold your devotions and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needeth anything. Seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Well, we've got our answer right there. He needs nothing, nothing at all. He doesn't need your praise either. Now, the being worshipped with men's hands, of course, does not refer here to praise. It refers to the... Uh, pagan religions of offering up their food to their idols and to their gods. In other words, the, the ministration of food by the hands. But he said, neither is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. This was a revolutionary concept for Paul to be preaching to the Athenians because they thought the gods needed them. And that's what most of us have been taught, that God somehow needs us. In whatever we're doing and all that we're doing, God somehow needs us. Now, this was a revolutionary impact in Paul's preaching to come upon the Athenians and say that God doesn't need anything. And he's made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed in the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us. Now that shows his vital relationship that he maintains with his creation, whereas verse 24 shows his transcendence above his creation. Verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being, to show that we are not self-sufficient and not self-sustaining, contrary to what God is, that he points out in the preceding verses that God of all things is self-sustaining and self-sufficient, needing nothing at all. So whenever he created things, it was not because he had a need of creation. I guess the most common misconception people have if they believe that thing, that God somehow had a need of creation, was that he was lonely. And I don't mean lonely in the sense that uh, he was real miserable and sad, but just lonely. He wanted some type of fellowship with someone, someone to talk to, someone to communicate with. But there again, if you say that, then you're saying that God had a need of creation. The Bible just said he needs nothing at all, nothing from us at all. So that would prove that wrong in a hurry. God does not need anything. Over in Psalm 50, which is a beautiful psalm, speaking of God's wonderful glory and transcendence above all that he has made. The mighty God, even the Lord, hath spoken. And call the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. Our God shall come and shall keep silence, shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. Some of this is end-time teaching. 
He shall call to the heavens from above. So that means he must be below the heavens at this time, which shows you that it must be in time. And to the earth that he may judge his people. You see, friends, there are so many, well, gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Sacrifice in there. Seems like we've mentioned that verse and that message we did not, well, that's been over a year ago on sacrifice. The heavens shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, and I will testify against thee. I am God, even thy God. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings to have been continually before me. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goats out of thy fold. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. <laughs> Doesn't sound like he needs anyone there. He said, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you about it. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? All for unto God thanksgiving. That's the sacrifice of verse 5. And pay thy vows unto the Most High. And call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. Well, we could go on. We'll stop there with verse 15. So we see in verse 12, he's asking a rhetorical question, of course, to the people here, a satire. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee. For the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High. So we see, first of all, that God absolutely has no need whatsoever of anything that he has created, no need of anything that he's created, whether it be a microorganism all the way up to your largest human being or any human being, Christian or otherwise, he has no need of anything that he's created. He must have done it, in other words, for some other purpose, for some other reason. And this is the question we're looking at. Why has God created all things? Well, let's look over in uh, Isaiah. Well, let's look over it while we're in Psalms and go to Psalm 100 and look at least at part of the reason for creation, part of God's purpose for creation. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Now going over to Isaiah 43, I bet, this is, I bet you thought that Psalm 100 would have been a good interpretation for the reason of creation that God gives us in Isaiah 43, verses 1 to 7. But it's only part of this great purpose for which God has created us. I mean, really, he, doesn't, he only gives us uh, so much of an answer to this question. I might as well let you know that ahead of time. He only gives us so much of an answer. If you ask him, Lord, why are we created? He's only giving you so much of an answer. Now, you might think that you had the total answer here from Isaiah 43, but I'll show you how you don't. You've only got a very, very small portion of the answer from Isaiah 43. But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee. So the subject is creation here. O Jacob and he that formed thee, used synonymously, of course. O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, and thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. And when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable. 
and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee and people for thy life. Fear not, for I am with thee, and I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Now look at verse 7. All of you probably already know this verse. Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory, I have formed him, yea, I have made him. So it would appear that we've got an answer on why God has created us. It said, I have created you for my glory, but then what does that mean? What does it mean when God says, I've created you for my glory? Does that mean, or can we restrict that only to the meaning that we read over there in Psalm 100? I've created you for my glory. I've created you so that you can glorify me, praise me, worship me, thank me. Now, this is what most people feel Isaiah 43 and verse 7 is saying. When it says, I have created you for my glory, that God, in other words, needs or wants, I don't know which word they want to use, glory, and so he's created us so that we can glorify him. But that's going right back to the question we just raised in the beginning. God doesn't need anything. You see? Going right back to that same thing. God created me so I can praise him. He didn't need you to praise him. Right? Isn't that right? Isn't that what Acts 17 said? As though he needed anything? In other words, he doesn't need anything. Well, let me show you something else over in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, just to expand a little bit upon uh, this verse here in Isaiah 43 and verse 7. Sure, he has created us for his glory. But that does not mean, and there's nothing wrong with praise, he commands us to do that, but what I'm trying to show you is that's not the one reason God created us so that he could have someone praise him because he didn't need that. He was great already. He didn't need anyone to tell him he was great. He was great and he already knew that. Now that he has created us, in other words, the, the, the commandment to praise him didn't come before creation, it came after creation. Now that we are created, now he says, I command you to tell me that I'm great because he already knew he was great in the beginning. So therefore, there would have been no need to create us with the one thought or purpose in mind being that I want to have someone to tell me how great and wonderful and faithful I am. Now, once we had already gotten here, once the trees and everything had already gotten here, he said, now I'm going to use all this to praise me. But he didn't start off with that thought saying, I want to have someone to praise me so I'll make man so he can praise me because then he'd need something. You see, we'd be reasoning around in circles, in other words. Now, if he said there in Isaiah 43, 7, I have, I have made you, created you, formed you, all three words used synonymously, we'll be using that verse later on in, in one of the uh, erroneous teachings that have arisen, Isaiah 43, 7. We'll be coming back to that. But when he said, I've created you for my glory, and most charismatics anyway think that that means to praise the Lord, well, then let's come over, well, I'm in the wrong chapter, to 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 7. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Now, it didn't say that the man was created so that he could glorify God. It says that the man is the glory of God. Well, then what does this mean? And don't be uh, ashamed, any of you women. He goes on finally in verse 12 to say, but all things are of God. So he includes the women there. All things, both the man and the woman, are of God. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and the glory of God. See, all that ought to be puzzling to you. Psalm 76. Psalm 76. What does this strange verse mean? Psalm 76 and verse 10. Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee, 
The remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. Well, the first part of the verse. Surely, surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. Well, you see what God's trying to show us, friends, in these verses and in many other verses here in the Scriptures is to get our mind and get our concept beyond just a stagnant thought that all we are here is just to lift up our hands and praise the Lord and that is how we glorify God and that is why He has made us. That couldn't be the total truth because over there in 1 Corinthians 11 it says that man is the glory of God. Just man himself without doing anything. In other words, without lifting up his hands and praising just man, just sitting there, just living there, just his existence, his very existence is the glory of God. Now you see that takes us beyond just that restricted sense of glory that we are to lift our hands and glorify the Lord and praise Him, which is something, as I said, we're commanded to do, but not until after God has already created all things. So what he is meaning there in Isaiah 43 and verse 7, well, let's go over to Ephesians 3. In explaining this, And in explaining the verse there in Psalm 76, you see, God is receiving glory not when men are lifting up their hands and praising Him, but just by virtue of the fact that He has created man in the first place or that He has created anything that is His glory there, that is a manifestation of His glory. And He doesn't have to have anyone tell Him that he's glorious, he's already manifested or demonstrated his gloriousness by what he's created. And when it says there that the wrath of man will praise thee, all of this involved in God's glory and in God's creation, what do you think something like that's talking about? Well, let me just give you some examples and you'll see what something like that is talking about and how God daily is receiving glory not, and without anyone lifting up their hands and having to glorify Him or praise Him, He is still daily receiving glory. Let's say someone's driving home from work. It's a hot afternoon, no air conditioning in the car. The wrath of man shall praise thee. And they begin to curse because of the heat. Now, you might not see any glory in that. But I see glory in that. Because with all of man's inventions and all of, that man has done, he could never come up with the wherewithal to heat this whole globe here. And God does without lifting one finger. The wrath of man will praise him. You see, you might not have ever seen any glory in that. Men cursing God because it's hot. But God sees glory in that. God sees glory because he thinks you couldn't in all your contract, all your imaginations that you've done, you, could, you couldn't come close to heating, uh, you can barely heat your own home. I mean, it's leaking out all sides. <laughs> and you lay down a half a foot or two feet of insulation on top trying to hold that heat in there. And God never lifts a finger and heats the whole globe. <laughs> and the same is true with it being cold. People complaining when it's cold, they begin to curse God and the wrath of man will praise him there. Because, let's see, where, what psalm is that that says that very thing? I'll have to go find that one. Because see, here during the summertime, man's trying to chill his house down a little bit. Psalm 147 and verse uh, 15. See, it's for, it's for each one of us to see his glory and to speak of his glory one to the other. As a matter of fact, this is what we're told to do over in Psalm 145. To, well, we won't go over there and read it, but to speak to one another of God's glory and of God's creation. He's seen what he's done. But every time someone's cursing God because it's too hot or because it's too cold or because that tree that's beside their house has grown up too tall and they're afraid lightning's going to strike and fall on their house, in all of the wrath they have, there's God's glory because he's the one that made the tree in the first place. And the tree didn't have to do anything to praise him. The one who's angry and mad over it being hot or being uh, too hot or too cold, he's certainly not praising God there with his mouth or with his lips, but in the precepts that he's setting forth, it's God's glory being manifested all over again because he's the only one that can do that. 
Psalm 147 in verse 15. He sendeth forth his commandment upon the earth, and his word runneth very swiftly. He giveth snow like wool, he scattereth the hoarfrost like ashes. He casteth forth his ice like morsels, and who can stand before his coal? Who can stand before his coal? And the places here on the earth where it, where it gets cold, of, co of course, are nothing compared to, let's say, the planet Pluto and what the temperature would be on the planet Pluto because it's so far away from the sun. And we think it gets cold above the Arctic Circle or in Antarctica. That's nothing compared to what it would be on the planet Pluto. Who can stand before his cold? And we can't stand before his cold just on this planet, let alone going to some other planet. Go back to Ephesians 3. See, God's not trying to show himself anything. He's showing us all of these things. That's how he can say that he doesn't need anything. But, well, you see, what I'm getting around to, it's like this. Let's take a man who has made a marvelous invention. He doesn't need anyone to come to him and tell him that he's made a marvelous invention. He receives glory and praise just when people say, look at that, isn't that beautiful? Even though he never even hears them say that. It's because they see his handiwork and they see what he's done. And therefore, glory is being given to him, but it's being given back and forth between the people that are seeing what he has made. And it's the same thing true with the subject of creation. With us talking one with another, back and forth between one another, God's receiving glory. It's not, so, it's not whenever we're lifting up our hands and praising him, anything that he's ever done, all that he's ever made. You see, he doesn't make things like computers and cars that rust and wear out and break down after a while. He's made something where he said in Genesis 1.31 that behold, it was very good. And the only reason that we see some things today in creation that are not very good is because sin entered the world. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered the world and death, Romans 5, 12, by sin. Not just death upon mankind, but death. It's the law of entropy. It's the law of destruction. It's the law of utter wastelessness of everything that's been created, as we're told over there again in Hebrews 1, a very important chapter, that one day... He's going to fold up like a garment all the things that he's made, going to put them away, and they're going to be changed just like that. Because he says there in Hebrews 1, they are, they are decaying and waxing old. But he said, you change not from generation to generation. It's the Father there speaking of the Son in Hebrews 1. But it's because sin has entered the world, Romans 5, 12, and death by sin, that we see some things out there. And just think of this, friends. Sin has entered the world, and because of sin, death and all of its concomitant evil affections that go along with it have entered the world also. But when we look out there, we can still see a beautiful, glorious creation. What must it have been like before sin entered the world? If it's that beautiful after sin and the law of death has passed upon all things. This is why, friends, we are studying all these things and trying to learn all these things because we're told in Romans 8 that God's going to use the sons, the matured sons of God, to deliver this groaning creation from all of its bondage and corruption. That's what the overcomer's ministry is all about, to go around setting the captives free and delivering this creation and will be the ones, the 144,000 of Revelation 12 and 14 will be the ones that usher in a new kingdom and a new age here on the world where we're told there in Isaiah chapter 11 that everything will be changed back to the pattern of the garden all over again. You see, that principle of decay is set in there, but God's going to rectify. He's going to staunch that problem, but he's going to do it, he says in Romans 8, with the manifested, matured sons of God. Now, don't ask me how he's going to do it. I don't know, but he's going to do it. He's going to do it by the matured, manifested sons of God. Romans chapter 8 and verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creation waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creation was made subject to vanity, not willingly. It didn't want to be. But by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. In other words, Adam is the one. But creation participated in all of the fall. But it says they are waiting 
to be ushered into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So that's why we're learning and that's why we're studying these things. So we can go out and bring down those strongholds and bring about a new heavens and a new earth. Ephesians 3, we're over in Ephesians 3. And verse 7, Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all, now it shouldn't have men in there uh, because it's going to go on to include more than men in verse 10. He's wanting all, that is everything, all things. So it shouldn't be men in there. And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Now, why did he create all things by Jesus Christ? He gives us the reason in verse 10. More of God's glory manifested. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the assembly the manifold wisdom of God. Now, he's talking about the wicked principalities and powers there. And he said so that by the assembly so that what they see we're doing even this night might be made known the manifold wisdom of God. Now, they don't understand everything that we're saying here tonight, but they've heard what we just said. Now, you see, friends, there's a very real spiritual world and sphere that exists right in our midst. For the continuation of this message, please turn the night, but they've heard what we just said. Now, you see, friends, there's a very real spiritual world and sphere that exists right in our midst. And they heard what we just said about about God manifesting his son and delivering this groaning creation. Now, they don't have to understand all that, but they can see the wisdom of God in that. And this is what he says in verse 10. God's created all things to the intent. You see, what he wanted to do was to bring about this body, all the local bodies, to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the assembly. In other words, the assembly is what's going to make known the wisdom of God to those principalities and to those powers. And that's what we're doing when we're learning God's Word, standing up here studying the Scriptures, teaching the Scriptures. We are showing them what the wisdom of God is all about. You see, they can hover over most churches and they're more wise than most pastors are. But when they hover over the assembly of God, not the assemblies of God denominations, the assembly of God, this is the assembly of God. Paul said, I'm writing to you saints at the assembly. The assembly of God. This is the assembly. But when they hover over the assembly of God, then they see and hear the wisdom of God manifested. They're not going to act in faith upon it, just like most Christians won't act in faith upon it. But they'll nonetheless hear it, and they'll see the wisdom of God in what's being said there. Because, you see, friends, they understand enough to realize they are included in the last part of verse 9, who created all things by Jesus Christ. They're created. Satan knew that in the beginning. His name was Lucifer at that time. He knew that in the very beginning. But he didn't understand this wonderful plan. Well, he goes on in the next verse. I stopped reading. According to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. His eternal purpose of manifesting himself to all of creation, drawing all men unto himself, showing himself to be a just, impartial, and righteous God, by judging the world of its sin and iniquity, of an eternal purpose that he had from the very beginning. Now, let's go over to the book of Psalms again, over to Psalm 8, because I want you to go a little bit deeper with me here this evening in understanding why God has created all things. We read there in Isaiah 43 and verse 7 that he's created all things for his glory. But how about Psalm 8 and verse 1? O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth 
who has set thy glory above the heavens. The heavens are part of the things that were created there in Genesis 1.1. And if all things have been created for God's glory, then David comes along in verse 8 to pose a problem or an interesting situation when he says that God's glory he set above the very heavens. In other words, even if he had never created anything, his glory is still out there. And now that he has created things, his glory he has set above the heavens. That along with Psalm uh, 113. Praise ye the Lord. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. That was mentioned again over there when we first started reading in Psalm 50. It's always mentioning, it's always tying in God's creation when it's mentioning Him and His praise. Because, I mean, why does He stick the sun in here? The Lord is high above all nations and His glory above the heavens. Who is like unto the Lord our God who dwelleth on high, who humbleth Himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth? Exclamation point. He has to humble Himself to even come down and look at the earth. He has to humble himself even to come down and look at the heavens that he has created out there because his glory he's put far above all of those heavens. And when he, even, when he even wants to look at the earth, the Bible says he has to humble himself because the earth doesn't deserve his looking upon it. The heavens don't deserve his looking upon it. The sun in all of his might and all of his strength doesn't deserve the Lord looking upon it. And whenever he does choose to look upon it, then the psalmist says he has to humble himself because that's so much below him. <laughs> it's like you. You know, you have to bow down. If you wanted to look at an ant, you would have to humble yourself. You wouldn't be looking up here. You'd be getting way down there on your knees and look at that little ant. You'd have to humble yourself, condescend to his level to even look at him or consider him. And God says, I do the same thing to you. If I ever want to look at you, it's a, it's a great humility to me. Because you're, so, you're nothing to me and you're so much below me, I have to humble myself. What I think is great about that verse is not only the earth, but he says I have to humble myself to look at the things that are in heaven. That's all the vast universes that he's created. And he said they're not even worthy of me because the preceding verse said I set my glory above them. Well, we're going back to a, finally a verse that we have looked at earlier, and it was uh, mentioned in prophecy this evening. That's Revelation 4. This is, the most, this, this is the deeper meaning of creation. This is the most complete answer that I can give you because it's the most complete answer that he gives in his word, and he just doesn't try to explain it to us. But you see, he's not trying to get glory from men. He just glories in the fact that men are talking among themselves about his creation. He just glories in that fact because he knows that he outsmarted everyone, that no one can do what he did. And that thrills him. You might think that sounds selfish. It is. But he's a very selfish God. You see, we can't be selfish, but he can be. And the Bible says in the Old Testament, he's very jealous. And what, what does the Old Testament say he's jealous for? For his glory. For his holy name's sake. That, that's what he's jealous for and selfish. Now, to some people, that would look like a pagan god. That's why you've always got part truth mixed in with all air. Anytime you see air, all the airs in the world, you have some truth mixed in there because they make the gods look like selfish gods, like the pantheon of the Greeks and the pantheon of the Romans, selfish gods that want their own way. That's the same as our God. He wants his own way, and he's going to get it too. And he demands his own way. And he kills people that gets in his way. But look what he says, Revelation 4 and verse 11. And he doesn't try to explain it to us. He doesn't write a commentary after verse 11. Matter of fact, he puts a period after it. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Now, you don't have to understand that. Just receive it and just believe it. 
I mean, I can get in there and kind of understand what he means when he said, I've created all things for my pleasure, because that way he gets to run things. See, he had nothing to run earlier. But he likes to get in there and run things his own way, and he gets pleasure out of everything that he does. And there's no way you can even believe in the biblical view of the whole subject we're on, creation, and not believe in predestination along with it. They, they go hand in hand with one another. If you believe, if you believe in the biblical view of, of creation, you have to believe in predestination because we're told here that God has created all things for his pleasure. That means he gets to get, do up there with the strings and he just plays those strings back and forth and he gets to move you wherever he wants to move you. And it's humbling for him to give his word to you so that you can call upon his name. That's why God is so holy and so righteous. He had to send his son on our behalf and then to give his son a name that we could pray to the almighty God through, and that's through the name of Jesus because he wouldn't listen to us otherwise. It's too degrading for him to listen to us. But when he sets it up the way, sets up the formulas and the standards that he wants, then he doesn't mind listening to us because he's the one that did it in the first place. And when he says, now I want you to pray to me and I want you to pray to me in Jesus' name, then he doesn't mind us doing that at all. Now it seems to me another thing that would go hand in hand with creation is the whole message of faith. Um, if God has set this up this way and he's created all things and then he's given, he's humbled himself to give us his word and he's told us in his word John 14 and verse uh, 14, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it, then who are we to doubt what he said? If he said in John 14, 14, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it, then who are we to say, well, I don't know? Or who are we just to say, I don't believe you, God? Not to say it in so many words, but to say it in so many actions, and they speak louder than words but say, I don't believe you. Who are we to say that? You don't believe in creation. You, don't, you couldn't believe in the biblical view of creation, not believe in faith in God, faith for everything, because he's upholding and sustaining everything by his word. And then he's given us his word and said, now you can come to me according to my word, 1 John 5, 14 and 15, and I'll give you the petitions that you desire of me. Well... For thy pleasure they are and were created. I mean, you're just running around. Not when you're lifting up your hands. He didn't say that, that they glorify me and please me whenever they're lifting up your hands. Just you. You've been created for his pleasure. And do you know he gets pleasure? We're told this also over in Romans chapter 9 out of sending some people to hell. He still gets pleasure out of doing that because he gets pleasure out of doing whatever he wants to do. You see, when God, since God has humbled himself to come down on our level, friends, it would behoove us to humble ourselves before him and do what he ever, whatever he tells us to do because we've been created for his pleasure. And we ought to strive with all that is within us to give him pleasure in the godly and right sense of the word. Oh, he'll get pleasure out of you regardless of what you do. He'll get pleasure out of you because he's made you. And it says here, for thy pleasure they, were, they are and were created. What? All things created. So it must mean even sinners, God gets pleasure out of them. But he gets more pleasure and it'll be to your benefit. Oh, will it be to your benefit? To give God pleasure with your godly and righteous and upright life. That's what he wants you to do. Well, let's go on and look at some of these problematic questions now. Hallelujah. With what time we've got left. Now, we'll be turning back to the, the first 11 chapters of Genesis here. Just to give you some idea of uh, some different things that we'll be looking at here, I've got a list of 40 or 50 of them here. Talk slow. <laughs> I'll just repeat. It's hard to learn to talk slow, but I'm pretty good on repeating. Now, we're not going to be answering every single one of these questions, but the vast majority of these will come up somewhere in our teaching that we'll be doing on creation. Not all of them, but the vast majority. 
Well, first of all, I hardly know where to start here. There are other ones that I don't have written down that I'll be finding here in Genesis. First of all, in understanding that God created all things, does this mean that God has also created things such as atoms and space? Now, you think about that. As did God create space, in other words? Now, all these things are questions that we'll be raising and answering. And by space, don't just think of outer space because there's such thing as inner space, which means within our atmosphere, this is space here, inner space. Did he create this, this here? How did he go about doing that? I mean, I don't even see what he made there. I mean, you can understand he made this or what this came from, but this right here, right at the end of my finger, did he make that too? What is space? And how large is it? Now we're referring to outer space. What is it? Now if you're real smart, you might know that there are some gases and things floating around. What if we took all those gases and atoms out? Would there be anything there? What would there be? What? A vacuum? Yeah, there'd be a vacuum. You took the gases out, that means you'd take oxygen, air out, there'd be a vacuum. Well, what's a vacuum? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Did God create nothing? This brother says yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. How large is it? Now, we're talking about outer space here. How large is it? Well, these are interesting questions, I'll tell you. Get ready to preach on these questions here because uh, this brings up the whole subject of God himself. Uh, does God occupy space? Does he occupy? This isn't one of the questions. I'm just, well, you can write it down. I'm thinking of it. We won't cover this in creation, though. We'll cover this in theology. Does God occupy space? No one's venturing to make a fool of themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Does he? Well, if he's sitting on a throne, where's that throne? It's got to be somewhere, doesn't it? <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> that puts you on the safe side. That's a maybe answer, though. But the Bible said that our word's not to be yea and nay. <laughs> I got scripture for that. 2 Corinthians 1.20. So now, we're, if, we're, if we're asking, raising and asking this question, how large is space, then where is God, you know, in that space? Or if he's beyond it, then that means he doesn't occupy space. You see what I'm saying? If he's somewhere beyond that, he couldn't occupy space because space would have come to an end before we got to him. That, I guess, is probably one of the more of... Uh, of the philosophical question. But there is an answer to that. There most certainly is. But it again is deeper in God's Word that you don't get from Sunday school lessons or Baptist quarterlies. You don't get from charismatic quarterlies either. How old is the earth? Does the Bible give us this answer? How old is the earth? Pardon? No one really knows but God. Any of you know how old the earth is? 8,000? Is that an educated or uneducated guess? How old is Genesis 1? Yeah, that's essentially what I'm asking. Not its recording, but the events that it records. Six thousand? Where'd you get six thousand? One, one of my classes. I doubt you got that from one of my classes. You got that as a certain limit, but I can't say what. <laughs> we 
When were the other galaxies and planets made? They're not recorded in the book of Genesis. We don't see any mention of Mars being created in Genesis 1. So when were these other galaxies and these other planets created? Is there life on other planets? You could break this down into two different questions. Intelligent or unintelligent life? Either form. Is there life on other planets? Here's a good one. When were the angels created? Now you think about that. When were the angels created? We all know that they're created, so when were they created? Before man? How long before him? Half an hour? hundred years? When did Satan rebel and fall? We see him falling already in Genesis 3, verse 1. But when did he rebel and fall? In the afternoon? See, I, don't, I, don't, I haven't heard too many people know anything about it. Uh, they've come up with all types of misconceptions on when the angels were created and when Satan rebelled and fell. How long, in other words, how long was Satan there in his perfect state before he fell? Another question, how can we have light in Genesis 1 before the sun is created, which we do have? The very first thing God makes is light, but he has no sun. And you can't say that that light just emanated from God because it says that there was a morning and an evening, so God must be turning around or something. A dark and a light side. How can we have light before the sun? Because this is how we get our light now, by the sun. What is the Bible's position? Really, we could ask, does it even have one? Some people don't believe it even has one. What is the Bible's position on the so-called gap theory? Was there a pre-Adamite race of men? When was hell created? We're told there in Matthew that hell was created especially for the devil and his angels. Well, when was it created then? Does the Bible have anything to say about space travel? We enshrine our astronauts and bomb them in the Smithsonian. Well, what does the Bible say? Or does it have anything to say about space travel? Better believe it does. Not guesswork either. What does it mean to be created in the image of God? That's in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. There again, I'm hearing some charismatics say one thing and denominational people saying another and really neither one of them are right. What does it mean to be created in the image of God? That's a question that we probably won't get to in this class because you can tell by the question that deals more with theology. What does the Bible teach concerning the composition of man and animal? Is it bifold or trifold? The composition of man and animal. What and where was the Garden of Eden? And may it be found today. <laughs> what and where is the Garden of Eden? And may it be found today. Did Adam have any work to do in the garden? Here again, I'm hearing these goofy charismatics running off in all types of areas. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about, but I'll try to let you in on that secret later on. Did Adam have any work to do in the garden? Or did he just run around like a little god commanding everything and creating everything? <laughs> That's in effect what some people are saying. 
was Eve literally taking, taken out of the sight of Adam. In chapter 2, how could Adam have named tens of thousands of animals all in one day, all in one afternoon? God brought all the animals before him and it says Adam named all of them. How, how possibly could he name tens of thousands of animals and birds and insects and fish and reptiles all within a space of several hours one afternoon? You can't talk that fast. You couldn't talk that fast if you could talk as fast as I can talk. You'd never name all those animals. You would name it in a month, talking continually. Of the hundreds of thousands of different animals, and to be able to call all of them by an intelligent name. He didn't just A, B, C, D down the line there. All of them were called by an intelligent name. In other words, the name had something to do with the characteristic of the animal. What was the key to patriarchal longevity? They lived to be almost a millennium back then. We're not seeing too many reach that age today. Matter of fact, we're not seeing any reach that age today. So what was their key? Does the Bible give us an answer on what their key was to be able to live that long, both saint and sinner? Who was Cain's wife? How can we explain such things as petrified wood? Did the caveman really ever exist, the brute beast? that was half man, half ape, hairy, grunted, invented the wheel. Did he ever really exist? Did he? You might be surprised. Did dinosaurs... See, you don't, you don't know if I'm trying to trick you or not. That's why you're afraid to answer. Did dinosaurs ever really exist? Did vegetation and fish die in the flood? That's an important question. Vegetation and fish, did they die in the flood? He didn't take any fish on board, remember that. And what about vegetation? He didn't take any plants to plant either. Was the flood universal or was it local? Now, if you think it was universal, well, that means that the floods would have even had to cover mountains like Mount Everest, which is so high that you can hardly breathe up at the top of it. That means the ark would have been that high above the mountains, you couldn't have even breathed in the ark, the animals especially. So if it's universal and covered mountains that size, then they wouldn't have survived the ark. And also, if you believe it was universal, then what are you going to do with Joshua? And ver 24 and verse 2. Your fathers which dwelt on the other side of the flood. If there was another side to it, couldn't have been universal. But then if you believe it's local... And what are you going to do with the account in Genesis that said it covered all the high mountains, all places, everywhere? But in, in Joshua 24, it clearly says, but I took your fathers from the other side of the flood. Did the continents drift apart during the flood, known as the continental drift theory? You can come up and look on this map and see how the continents appear to fit together quite well. Is this what Genesis 10 and verse 25 is talking about? Was Methuselah still alive when the flood came? You count up those years, there he has to be. Did he get on the ark too and God just didn't mention him? How could Noah have fit all those thousands of animals in that little cracker box that he made? And if you got them on there, how could eight people have taken care of thousands and thousands of animals? How many people you have working at a zoo just to take care of those animals? They've got to eat, they've got to drink, they've got to use the restroom. 
How many people do you have? How many animals do you have there? Nothing compared to what Noah had. How can eight people take care of those animals? Where did they get food for the animals? Where did they get water to drink? Did the animals reproduce while they were on the ark? There you're really in trouble. How did Noah get animals like kangaroos that are indigenous to Australia? How did he ever get them to the ark? They would have to swim across the ocean to get there. And at the end, they'd have to swim back. <laughs> How did he get kangaroos? And the duck-billed platypus, indigenous to Australia. How did he get those on the ark? Or were they on the ark? What happened to animals like seals and dolphins? Well, I didn't even get to look through here. I, I thought of a bunch more in here that I didn't have written down, but we're about out of time. I'll end up with one last one. Was it Cain or was it Ham that God turned into a Negro? Remember, he put a curse on both of those. Which one was it that God turned into the Negro race? Cain or Ham? Remember, he set a mark on Cain. Turned him black. That way, everyone, when they saw him, they'd know he's different and leave him alone. Or what about on Ham? Another curse over there. Well, praise the Lord. We're out of time. Or I would go on. That's enough of them anyway. We'll get to the rest of them whenever we answer them. Hallelujah. You ought to know at least some of those answers to some of those questions. Maybe not all of them, but at least a few of them there. <laughs>